Forge, Chapter 18. Tuesday's sun shone uh, bright and cold. Breakfast was fire cake and water. Dinner was fire cake and water. The Janak brothers and me shoveled out the entire floor of our future hut halfway to our knees. My weary arms could barely lift up my cup of hot water to my mouth. After the sun dropped, supper was fire cake and water. I did not have anything amusing to say that night. The snow was crusted with ice the next morning, but it was as nice as the finest day in July, for the sergeant received another cloth bag of, by the ro or at roll. We stood around the fire like vultures as he cooked up the rice that it contained. Sergeant Woodruff carefully portioned out the feast. We each received one handful, seasoned with vinegar, to keep away the scurvy. I thought it likely that we would starve or freeze to death before expiring of scurvy. It tasted better than fire cake, so I kept the notion to myself. Where's Burns? He demanded when the rest of us had our had received our share. Squatted over a privy trench, sir. Farther down, uh, down the brigade, his bowels are giving him fits. Didn't want us to see his troubles. Fetch him. For once, I did not care a whit about the location or condition of John Burns. I tried to force myself to eat sl uh, the rice slow, one grain at a time, three grains at a time, too slow, a pinch, a slurp, not fast enough. I could not hold back. I shoveled the rest of the rice in my mouth as fast as I could, not caring that it burned all the way down. Aaron returned as we were all licking our fingers. I couldn't find him, sir. No one down here has seen him. Can I eat now? The sergeant handed a scoop of rice on a piece of bark to Aaron. Can we share Burns' portion, sir? I asked. No, the sergeant scraped the last of the rice from the pot. Half go of this goes to Greenlaw and the other half to Ebenezer. Wood chopping is vastly harder work than shoveling or hauling firewood. Just because he didn't, or just because he was right, didn't it didn't fill up my belly. I drew some comfort, however, when Burns straggled back into camp, spouting stories about his afflictions, and then outrage for he appeared in time to watch the biggest two lads of our company swallow the last of the rice. That was most satisfying. That afternoon, the Janaks were ordered to help lay the roof beams on the officer's hut. So Benjamin Edwards, who had, been at, or who had asked us to call him Benny, and Hugh Faulkner helped me dig the floor. The shovel weighed twice as much as it had the day before. The mud fought against uh, being moved. My hands were too cold and stiff to close around the handle properly, and my boots were determined to trip me up. To distract us from our hunger and fatigue, Benny told us stories about strange creatures, a 50-headed dog, a horse with wings, and a monster that had front legs of a lion, the back legs of a goat, and the tail of a serpent. He leaned against the shovel. And then there's the one about the fellow who plowed the fields of Field of Dragon's Teeth. Where'd you hear such a fantastical thing, I asked? In books. I'm a prodigious reader. If your family can afford books, why did you sign up to be a private? Faulkner asked. Surely your father could have gotten you a commission as an officer and aide. Benny picked up the shovel and drove it into the mud. I was supposed to go to Harvard College this winter to study law, although I believe my true calling is to be a philosopher. My father changed his mind and was preparing to send me to London instead. He believes the rebellion is a, uh, a grievous mistake. Your father's a Tory? I asked. Benny frowned and awkwardly tossed the heavy mud to the side. If it were up to him, the entire Continental Army and Congress would be lined up and shot. He threw me out after an argument about the Declaration of Independence. That's why I enlisted. His words sounded brave, but his voice cracked with the weight of his feelings, and he looked younger than ever, like a boy who would have been in a schoolroom instead of a soldier trying to build a hovel out of the snow. He pushed his hair out of his face and thrust the shovel into the ground overly hard. The shovel skidded on a stone and Benny stumbled, trip, and landed on the blade. Faulkner and I hurried to help him to his feet. You hurt bad? I asked. No. He stood slowly and examined the wreckage of his breeches, ripped just above the knee, t uh, knee ties clear up to his backside. Skin was cut too, though not deep. Uh, perdition, he shouted. Oh, foul, poxy devil, by the blasted sorry dickens. I bit my tongue to keep from laughing. The lad's attempt at cussing like a soldier made him sound like a mild mouth granny. You'll be cursing a frozen backside tonight, Faulkner said, pointing to the way Benny's breeches flapped in the wind. Tis a badge of honor, I said quickly. Makes you look more soldierly. You should st uh, say those breeches are veterans of a fierce encounter at Saratoga or the Brandywine. Really? Benny asked. Won't help him none of his hindquarters get frostbit, Faulkner said. Doctors might have to amputate, leaving you rumpless. They wouldn't. Benny covered his rum. Rump, would they? 